all my name is mallika kartare and i work as a business development manager for nano medicine research group at institute of chemical technology mumbai i am here by to give a short introduction to the event and session again we welcome and thank all exhibitors session panelists and visitors to the inaugural of phdh virtual event and hope you have visited the wonderful exhibits Several Indian and foreign companies are participating and we encourage you to see the displays after the session or at any time till September 25th. We also encourage you to inform to your friends, colleagues to register and participate in the several sessions that are scheduled over the next few days. We are aware that there are many foreign delegates in the audience and we thank them for attending despite the time difference. Proceeding towards the introduction of vaccine sessions Since it began in late 2019 the speed and severity of covid-19 pandemic has caught most governments international organizations vaccine vaccine researchers and manufacturers of guard who are now trying to develop an effective and safe vaccine in a quick time many candidates are under trial another important issue is that even if a suitable vaccine is developed how will it be upscaled and distributed to billions who will need to be vaccinated to discuss the topical and rather difficult issues we have panelists from three important indian vaccine companies with us this morning and ms pushpa vijay raghavan director of sadguru management consultant will moderate this interesting session i kindly invite her to initiate with the session over to you thank you ms. dr malika appreciate the introduction uh, and and glad to have the day start today with this session Uh, i know from discussions with the organizers that uh, obviously this is the most looked you know this is the session that everybody is looking forward to most uh, during this four day program uh, but i think more than anything else it's very critical that uh, that we are able to convene to have this important discussion around access and scale up um, just to set the context i think as of today uh, the world is closing to almost a million cases of covid-19 Uh, it was 967 million as of yesterday i mean 967000 as of yesterday uh, not too far from a million think back in uh, i actually very very strangely remember this conversation um, early this year when uh, when when the covid-19 incidence was just starting in china uh, a conversation with one of the leading vaccine companies to say should we prioritize a vaccine right and at that point when we were brainstorming in that discussion we said let's just hold and watch uh, if this is just going to be restricted to you know china there may not be as much of a global demand but uh, it's very unfortunate we were all proven wrong um, and and today we we're, we're actually staring at 200000 cases of deaths in the us india is second in terms of number of cases overall um, with about 5.6 million again as of yesterday um, the economic impact is also unmanageable so we're dealing with these complex trade offs of how do you get the economy back on track uh, and as per gavi's estimates again you know more than 350 million dollar monthly loss from an economic perspective uh, because of the pandemic and at this point i think every one of us is looking to a vaccine uh, as a most sustainable solution out of this public health and economic crisis of this global magnitude in fact just before this we were chatting that all our panelists have been extremely busy uh, and we're glad they are because we you know i think all of us are waiting uh, very very eagerly for the solution that you hold ahead for us with that uh, i will first set stage introducing our panelists uh, we have uh, maima datla from biologically uh, someone of a lot of respect for in terms of how she's built biologically over the last few decades uh completely changed the paradigm of access to pentavalent vaccines in the world uh you know with, with the with the kind of access they created uh, she's played a steering role in bodies such as gavi and developing country vaccine manufacturer association over the years uh thanks for for joining us today we really appreciate it uh we have we have Dr. Sai Prasad from Bharat Biotech uh he is currently the president of the developing country vaccine manufacturer association uh very critical body converging uh the manufacturers supplying lmic countries uh sai so again played a role ensuring uh, quality of vaccines that bharat has supplied over the years uh, one of the initial companies in the 90s to introduce the first recombinant vaccine in india uh, with the hepatitis b 
uh, and set the benchmark in terms of access and pricing again. Thanks for joining us, Sai. We have Dr. Kapil Mehtal here. Uh, again, experience, substantial experience in the Indian vaccine industry. Uh, today leads the, uh, the vaccine and diagnostics effort at Zyrus Cadilla or Cadilla Healthcare. Um, and, uh, and again, he's, you know, a company where he's, he's really steering a very strong vaccine platform technology, a very strong vaccine portfolio uh, from a company with an existing investment muscle, a leading pharma company now transitioned into uh, a formidable force across the biologic spectrum. Thanks for joining us, Kapil. I'm going to request our panelists to set the stage by talking about the COVID-19 vaccine effort uh, in each of their companies and what is the status of the program, what do we expect in terms of, uh, in terms of what that means for the Indian public and public at large. You know, we'd love to start off with an introduction about your programs. Maima, can you go first? Sure. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Pushpa, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this forum. Uh, I'll jump right into it uh, for paucity of time and just get to where we are with our COVID vaccine development. Um, you know, before I do that, historically as a company, we focused a lot on the development side of R&D and we've partnered with academia, small biotech, and even large pharma for that matter for the discovery component of R&D, even though we're starting to do some of that ourselves now. So this has pretty much been the case for our COVID vaccine R&D efforts as well. And in this case, we've partnered uh, with more than one academic um, institutions for largely the development of various clones for the RBD construct. Um, and in our case, these are MIT and uh, Baylor. And what they've been focusing on is really early at the during the early part was developing different clones and what we've been focusing on for the past several months now is really the down selection of clones um, and the constructs um, so the idea is we use a bunch of parameters largely related to manufacturability as well as obviously immunogenicity amongst other things in order to down select what would be the optimal construct. So that was the early days of COVID development. We're past that now. Um, and one of the reasons we selected RBD, um, and I keep taking for granted, everyone will know what RBD means, but it's really the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, which is responsible to attach itself to the ACE2 receptors in human cells. So that's how coronavirus enters our body. And it's pretty much, I've used this analogy before, it's like a lock and key. So the idea is that smaller the protein, uh, the lesser the side effects, or that's what people anticipate. Um, but it's easier to express these proteins in, um, in established uh, platforms. One of the reasons we chose this was because we have a really well-established platform for hepatitis B vaccines, and we've been making several hundred million doses of the same. Uh, so speed was key in the case of coronavirus vaccines, um, and we chose uh, we chose this. The idea is that your body will create antibodies to prevent the lock from entering, uh, to prevent the key from kind of entering the lock. Um, so what we've been focusing on is really the down selection, but I think the biggest capabilities of the company lie in process development, in scale up, in large scale manufacturing. Um, and obviously commercialization. So obviously in the early stages, there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, and while we're doing that, I have to say there's been an unprecedented level of partnership activity across the board. Uh, we've all been reading about it in the news literally on a daily basis. Um, you know, what you wouldn't consider usual suspects have learned to partner and collaborate with each other, which is, you know, Sanofi and GSK are an example. Not that they haven't done it in the past, but I, I, I have to say I've seen a lot more pragmatism than ever before. In our own case, um, in addition to partnerships on the early clone development, and that too is um, the need for speed to have several partnerships, but we've also entered into partnerships with respect to adjuvant um, evaluation. Uh, we believe that an adjuvant will be critical for some of these vaccines, particularly the protein ones. And it's important to see what the persistence will be because it's unclear what the persistence 
assistance or, you know, um, again, in layman terms to evaluate how long the antibodies will persist in the body with any given vaccine, what's the boostability, all of these are still unknowns. I mean, we haven't even had the opportunity to learn from other people's failures in that respect. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, we will shortly start phase one studies, but we spent a lot of time on the preclinical evaluation, the down selection of the antigen and adjuvants, to be honest. Um, and we've spent a lot of time on manufacturability. So I think once the clinical trials are underway, we would be able to rapidly scale such that by the time we're licensed, uh, we would have very large capacities to offer. So I think I'll pause there if, if you think that's okay. You're on mute, Pushpa. Thank you. Thanks for getting us started. And uh, I think the level of effort that's going in is obvious. Uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Sai, can you give us a, a few for what's happening at Harith? What are the programs ongoing now? You're also on mute, Sai. You're still on mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. So, you know, some of the strategies that Mahima mentioned, you know, we're also looking at um, similar concepts. But we, you know, about six months ago or seven months ago, we took a fundamental decision that, um, you know, the first wave of vaccinology and vaccine development, we need to be fast, we need to be safe, we need to go to known concepts, you know, instead of new concepts and new technologies and new strategies. So we decided as a first concept that we will try and develop a vaccine with a whole virion inactivated vaccine. That's what we have done which we were able to go from the clone to preclinical talks and phase one clinical trials within a short span of two to three months. Uh, the reason we're able to do that is because our manufacturing platform is well established. We've already made about 300 million doses in that platform. Uh, we know how to make uh, live and inactivated viral vaccines. We've made that over several, several vaccines before. And we also know how to test it. We also know how to do Q um, all the other scientific rigor and the quality rigor that's required to put a vaccine out there. So we're able to do that. So we, you know, we went um, uh, with the whole Virion vaccine, which is Covaxin, which is BBV-152. You would have seen quite a bit of media related to that. So that's now completed phase one clinical trials. We are getting ready to submit our data to our drug controller general of India. Uh, we've also started our phase two clinical trials, and in the month of October, we plan to start our phase three clinical trials. And in the meantime, we've also done challenge studies with both hamsters and uh, non-human primates, and the data looks uh, extremely good um, with two doses of our vaccine and uh, a live viral challenge about seven days after the second dose. So the the most of the pointers are pointing in the right direction. Uh, obviously, the phase three clinical trials are pivotal. Uh, we need to prove safety and efficacy in that clinical trial. Uh, we're targeting about 25 to 30,000 subjects. Um, the sample size estimates are still under discussion uh, based on which sites, which countries, and where we are planning on conducting it. But the general uh, line would be about 25 to 30,000. And we think it's important that any uh, COVID-19 vaccine, for it to be successful, it needs to have uh, good phase three efficacy data uh, to show how the vaccine worked in real life and what the safety issues are and what the efficacy issues are. So that is, that is well underway. And uh, in terms of manufacturing, uh, we are already manufacturing product at risk. Uh, we have an installed capacity right now. We have two different facilities that are both BSL-3 or biosafety level three compliant. Uh, we can manufacture anywhere between 100 to 200 million doses in these facilities, and we are 
uh, actively trying to manufacture as much as we can right now because we have the necessary permissions. And we're also exploring strategies to expand the manufacturing footprint, not just in Hyderabad, but in other cities of India and also in other parts of the world. So we're talking with our partners to see if they're able to receive tech transfer from us and to scale up. So if that is, uh, you know, those are those discussions are ongoing right now in about four or five different countries. Uh, once those are established, I think we will, we should be able to reach a manufacturing scale of about a billion doses a year. And those will all be what we call as distributive manufacturing. They're going to be manufactured in local markets and supplied uh, locally with the same quality and the quality control standards. So that is one strategy, but we also know that the concept that all of us are working on right now, these are uh, intramuscular injections or intradermal injections. Uh, they need uh, vaccine, they need uh, syringes, they need needles, they need uh, alcohol swabs, they need a trained uh, nurse or a doctor or a uh, Anganwadi worker or anybody else who is able to administer vaccines, you know, the traditional way it's done. So because of all these issues, and if we have to vaccinate our country, we need about a billion units or two billion units of syringes, needles, uh, personnel, everything to do those vaccinations. So one of the concepts we are working on, not with Covaxin, but it's another uh, vaccine that we are under development, is trying to develop an intranasal vaccine because we see that the delivery is key in trying for us to conquer uh, COVID-19 because I don't think that we can conquer this uh, disease by injecting people with our vaccines. We need to think about intranasal delivery systems and we're working on that already. We've done a lot of animal testing in Hyderabad in the United States. We have good challenge data already for that second candidate. And we're in the process of now scaling it up and starting to apply for our uh, clinical permissions for that candidate. With that, I'll take my questions off the air. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Thank you. Uh, I think very, very helpful to understand the, the, the approach of parallel programs and, uh, and initially, you know, taking the lower risk approach. Uh, I will turn to Dr. Kapil here. Kapil, I know you all have a DNA vaccine. A um, lot of people in the audience have questions around, are that, is that safe? There are no approved DNA vaccines. I'll let you talk about your program and demystify that a little bit. Um, I normally encounter a lot of questions on, you know, is this even worth it, you know, going through DNA vaccine route? Is this, I hear it's unsafe. So I think it'd be helpful to, to add a little bit on the technology end as well. So thank you, Pushpa. Yeah, I do also get a lot of questions on the same front. And uh, I think the whole thing started in the month of February when the cases started uh, coming. And uh, we decided as a strategy that we should start working as one of the major uh, pharma company in the country on developing a COVID vaccine. Uh, in the past, I'll just give you a brief background about the company. We have been uh, working on a lot of vaccines. Uh, and uh, in fact, we were the first company to launch the swine flu vaccine in 2010, uh, when a pandemic had occurred uh, in our country. And then we had gone ahead and developed a lot of vaccines, uh, which have been indigenously developed for the first time. And some of them are already in the market. Now, coming back to the uh, COVID vaccine, so this, uh, as I was mentioning, the work started somewhere in the month of February. And at that point of time, uh, we looked at the historical data and we found that only the kind of vaccines which has shown significant efficacy uh, for coronavirus infections have been DNA vaccines. In fact, uh, there had been a clinical data for MERS and SARS DNA vaccines, which had shown efficacy uh, to the tune of 94% and 80% uh, respectively, uh, respectively in the clinical trials. And uh, we thought that we need to work on a vaccine candidate which is safe. So safety was of paramount importance, uh, followed by uh, efficacy. And DNA vaccines per se are considered to be a very safe platform to work on. So that was the reason we started work on. We have another candidate which we have been working on, uh, is on a measles vector uh, approach. And uh, that candidate would also be entering into preclinical uh, studies uh, in coming months. Uh, so the advantage of this candidate has been that it can be made in a biosafety level one manufacturing facility. So the technology transfer to other partners is very easy to do that. We have been in discussion with a number of uh, global partners 
And uh, we also, as I mentioned, uh, we are also uh, feel that there would be a global distribution of the vaccine as we move forward. Uh, another important aspect of this vaccine candidate is the ease of developing the construct. And uh, we believe that there is a high possibility that uh, there may be mutations in the virus due to the immune pressure uh, once the cases reach a particular threshold. And the vaccine can then rapidly be adopted to switch to a new sequence uh, without any uh, significant impact on the process development, which can be rapidly adapted as well for the new construct. So like what we see in uh, seasonal flu vaccines, there is a strain change every year. And in this uh, COVID vaccine uh, or the COVID uh, disease, we don't know how rapidly the mutations may happen as we move forward. So these were the few aspects which had driven us to work on a DNA vaccine candidate. And uh, we were able to complete successfully the process development of this candidate. We found that the vaccine was able to elicit a very strong immune response in multiple animal species. We tested in mice, rats, guinea pigs, and rabbits. Uh, we found the antibodies were able to neutralize the virus completely in a in vitro neutralization assay. Uh, our challenge studies currently are in progress. Uh, we also, uh, before going to the clinical trials, we ensured that we had done a complete preclinical toxicity study for this uh, candidate. And we did uh, uh, the regular 28 day repeat tox study in uh, rats and rabbits. And we found that the vaccine candidate was very well tolerated, up to three times the maximum intended single human dose. Uh, which gave us the confidence to move into the clinical trial. Uh, with that, we started our phase one trial. And again, in the phase one trial, we did not follow the OPD model, uh, but we followed uh, the regular model, which is done for vaccines classically, where the patients are housed in an ICU unit, uh, where uh, they were monitored for 24 hours. We had all their uh, blood and biochemical parameters monitored to ensure the safety of the vaccine. And with that data, an independent DSMB approved the candidate to move into the phase two trial. And as we speak, the phase two trial is currently in progress. Uh, we believe uh, the initial results are very encouraging and uh, we would be completing our phase two trial in coming months. And uh, at that point of time, move into a phase three clinical trial. Uh, the subject size, again, would be in the order of what I mentioned. It would be around 15,000 to 20,000 uh, subjects. I think that is important to ensure the safety and efficacy of any vaccine candidate which moves forward. Uh, so I think that's where I'll take a pause. Thank you. Thank you, Kapil. Um, you know, I'm glad you all, you both took us into discussion on phase three and size of trial. Um, you know, I just, you know, as, as much as the economic impact has been high, um, there are countries in the world where it's an election year. Uh, unfortunately, a public health response has been quite politicized in, in several contexts. Uh, but that apart, I think there is a, there is a question of, there's, there's a lot of curiosity around uh, an EUA uh, for the vaccine. You know, when we're talking of a timing discussion and accelerating the approval, uh, you know, what, what are we doing today to accelerate the vaccine development? And is an emergency use uh, a, a good approach to take? Uh, is, that, is that something you see happening in a widespread manner? I know it's a tough decision for policymakers because there are trade-offs. Uh, but, you know, can you, can you talk a little bit to acceleration and emergency use authorization and questions around timing um, that are quite complex for most people to grapple with when you're saying, how, when will we have this vaccine? Uh, is that end of 2020 for everybody at large? Is that mid of 21? Is that late 21? And, uh, and how can we speed up the process? You know, from an industry standpoint, can you educate our audience? Naima, either of you or Yeah. So in terms of acceleration, I mean, it's really impractical to expect um, that, you know, a typical development that takes seven, eight years at the very least, and that to, even if it's a follow on vaccine, to be compressed into four months or six months. So the, the fact that companies are able to respond so rapidly um, 
in this case, I think has been that, you know, there are several activities, for instance, you wouldn't do scale up activities when you're still doing process development. I think majority of us are doing that. Um, you would typically have all your essays, not only qualified, but completely validated, um, you know, end to end before you started any clinical studies. But we're doing that on the go. I mean, you know, as you work to develop, qualify, and um, and in. But I have to say that I don't think there's any shortcuts here when it comes to vaccine efficacy or safety. And majority of the countries, including the U.S., um, especially the U.S., have published guidelines when it comes to their expectations related to the, to both efficacy and safety. And I have to say that there is no notion of emergency use. Uh, either in U U.S. or WHO. Um, WHO, you know, um, it, it, during the early days, there was this idea where post phase two, you will have emergency authorization. But I think majority of the countries have made it clear that they want to see some efficacy data. As of a few days ago, India published its own guidelines, both related to efficacy uh, at a 50% threshold. I think that's in line with uh, with some of the country's guidelines as well. So I would say that when it comes to the actual clinical development part, there has been uh, there has been no um, uh, you know no acceleration. What we've been doing is trying to do a lot, combining a lot of the evaluation work. So typically you would first do safety and then you would do uh, dose ranging studies to evaluate dose in the second phase. But a lot of us are trying to combine the dose evaluations in the first phase itself. And that gives you another opportunity to be able to accelerate the overall clinical development. Um, at no time have manufacturers contemplated manufacturing at risk, that too in the scale that they're talking about. So I think that's also extremely different than when you think about, uh, when you think about you know, uh, normal developments, you wouldn't, make um you wouldn't make a hundred million doses of something and wait for wait for licensure so that's a huge risk that manufacturers are taking on and they're able to do so because you know we've seen uh push and pull mechanisms both be deployed at a massive scale uh and that too very quickly so i think they're playing a part in making um in allowing us to evaluate new technologies and allowing us to do at risk manufacturing and do and do efficacy studies. I mean, in follow on vaccines, typically, um, you know, we've not done the 20, 30,000 um, subjects, right? Unless it was innovative vaccines. But in this case, majority of the first gen vaccines for COVID will have to do uh, those kinds of studies and that to have the networks in order to do them rapidly. So those were the few opportunities for acceleration. Well, I, I don't recollect your second part of the question, Push, but if you could just remind me, I could try to. Yeah, no, I think largely I'm standing, uh, you know, kind of receptivity to an EUA approach or level of support for it and what's being done to accelerate. So. Yeah, I think that while it's not necessarily the typical EUL that you expect after a phase two, I think each country will take uh, risk decisions based on that, particularly as, you know, it's um, it, it's really saddening to see so many healthcare workers in the prime of their life um, succumbing to COVID. And uh, you need that because we already have such a gap um, in terms of health systems and responsiveness. So, you know, I think each country will make a risk assessment. But as far as the regulations go, uh, there is no notion of emergency licensure that's sort of put on paper that this is the pathway to emergency licensure. At least not that I'm aware of for the US, uh, not for WHO, and India it doesn't have that notion. But, you know, well into the later part of year or early next year, if there's compelling information coming out of these studies, because you have to remember most of the phase three studies are adaptive designs. So they have periodic readouts. And if you have a time point and a readout that is so compelling, the country may decide that, you know, the risk, um, you know, or the benefit far outweighs the risk. And at that point, decide that it's, it's prime for use, at least for first responders. So, yeah. Uh, I'll steer to, you know, we've been talking about manufacturing at risk. I'll steer to all of you uh, here to understand a little more about that. I think 
the industry is shouldering the level of risk that we don't really even understand. Right? I mean, normally, and this is published numbers from Gavi, where you know we're talking about probabilities of success of seven percent for a preclinical candidate and twenty percent for a clinical candidate in a normal vaccine world, the vaccine development process. Um, and here we are, you know, putting up facilities, uh, you know, north of hundred million doses everywhere, manufacturing, stockpiling at that scale. Uh, to make sure there is wider access, uh, how do we, how do we, how are we de-risking that? What's the kind of support that's there? How can we expand the scale of this level of capacity creation? So, can we talk a little bit to what's happening to trigger that capacity creation, and how can we expand that capacity creation? Because even with what's happening, we're not going to have the volume we need with what's invested today. We're far from from having that 10 million doses plus. So what, what is today supporting manufacturers? What mechanisms are there today to support manufacturers to take on that capacity creation at risk? And how do we expand that? So I can you talk from a DVCM perspective before we expand? Yeah. yeah. So I think, I mean, there are quite a few mechanisms available, uh, I would say. Um, internationally and um, maybe part of it within the country for de-risking some of our activities. But we, uh, for the large part, have tried to do this um, pretty much with internal resources. You know, we've not sought out any kind of external funding, whether it is from international agencies or from, um, you know, within uh, the government of India sources, because, you know, everything is happening in such a rapid scale and a rapid speed. And you know, to stop and think, to ask for a grant and wait for funding and wait for you know go no go decisions, we just don't have time for it right now. And and many of us are able to do what we do purely because we have access to facilities and capacities and capabilities that is already established. You know, if somebody is building a facility today to, to scale up this vaccine, it's going to be at least two years by the time that facility comes online, maybe even three years. So many of us have existing facilities. We are able to, uh, uh, you know, divert some of this capacity to those facilities. So that's how we are able to do what we are able to do. I don't think we can design a new facility today and construct it. Um, and that won't come to bear, at least, uh, you know, it'll come to bear maybe two or three years from now, which will be of some consequence, but not a lot, uh, uh, a major consequence. You know, I wanted to address one of the earlier points that you made about uh, shortcuts and quality standards and everything like that. You know, in the face of a pandemic, you know, if I was a carpenter, I would try to build a chair. And I'm not going to build a lousy chair just because it's a pandemic. You know, so the same logic for us. You know, we're all vaccinologists. We make vaccines, we develop vaccines, and we distribute vaccines. You know, we're not going to make shortcuts and some compromise on safety or efficacy or any of those other concepts just because it's a pandemic. Eventually, you know, the safety and efficacy have to come through in the clinical trials and, you know, people have to be benefited by it. So that's that's at least our strategy going forward. Thank you. Sure, Sai. Kapil, you want to add to creating capacity at scale in the world and how we can you know, scale that up in terms of capacity creation? Yeah, I think as uh, Sai also mentioned, there are a lot of mechanisms both uh, in country and globally, which are now supporting uh, both the push and pull mechanism uh, in terms of uh, accelerating the vaccine development. Uh, in India, a lot of uh, government agencies like uh, Department of Biotechnology, ICMR, CSIR, uh, DST actually have come uh, very rapidly and have been providing support to a lot of programs to ensure the vaccine development is accelerated. Uh, similarly, globally now this uh, COVAX uh, initiative, which has come, which has been supported by SEPI, uh, WHO, Gates Foundation. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, commitment, a lot of uh, in the recent pledging, which happened in June, I think a large uh, volume of uh, money was raised and uh, a large volume of doses have been committed. Believe that more than a few hundred million doses would be available by end of this year for whichever vaccine is moving forward uh, for global use. Uh, 
and by 2021, over 2 billion doses would be available. And I think it's a great initiative which is being taken. Obviously, there has been a lot of critics uh, on the way the allocation is happening on self-financing countries and the countries which could be supported by Gavi. Uh, but having said that, I think uh, it's a very good start, uh, which has happened. And uh, vaccine is something which has now become a household name. So it's really uh, heartening to see how uh, I think uh, when you go and you see the kids asking when is the vaccine coming, you really feel uh, uh, really happy to see that the field has taken a really big push. And as a vaccinologist, I think it's very important to ensure that the vaccine, whichever comes or which is ever is successful, is very safe and effective. Uh, coming to your previous uh, question on emergency use authorization, I think there have been cases uh, where uh, risk and benefit has been weighed upon the introduction of vaccines. And uh, there have been cases where a commercialized vaccine had to be withdrawn uh, when certain uh, adverse events were observed over a period of time. So I think, again, it depends with the way the cases are increasing, there is almost like, I think, 25% of the population which is at high risk, be it healthcare workers, uh, be it uh, elderly, be it, uh, I think, uh, people with comorbidities, uh, diabetics, uh, hypertensive patients. I think these are the people who would be the one who would need these kind of vaccines. Obviously, safety has to be demonstrated because they would be vulnerable uh, more than the regular population if an uh, ineffective or an unsafe vaccine is introduced. So I think that there has to be a balance. And as the data emerges for the phase two clinical trials for the vaccines which are being uh, conducted in the country, I think it will become more evident how the regulators would see whether the vaccine will get an emergency use authorization, at least in a select population, or one would need to wait for a phase three clinical trial completion. Sure. And I'm glad you bring up COVAX. I think, uh, again, not much is known in the broader world, but uh, as we've been debating how low middle income countries get access to the vaccine, especially in the light of the, of the agreements that high income countries have been forging with manufacturers and supply commitments, there is definitely this fear that you know, if your country hasn't already committed to buy a vaccine, you may not get the supply. So I'm glad you know we've, we've got our stakeholders come together to create Covax. So my I know you are been involved in the in the in the, in the creation of the uh, you know in the, in the oversight committee. So if you can also allude to the mechanism and the aspiration to address you know to up to 20 percent of the demand, uh, you know in terms of what the overall objective is uh, and what quantum of demand in terms of LMIC, uh, Covax as a consortium and what a program can help serve. Sure. Um, you know, really the vision behind the COVAX facility from the fact that, you know, barring India, China, and potentially Brazil, majority of the developing countries, um, including middle-income and upper middle-income countries, some, they don't lack resources, but majority of them lack the capabilities to do things like tech transfer and scale up of, uh, of vaccine manufacturing, at least for now, I mean, at least for uh, to be of immediate use. So, you know, the idea behind the COVAX facility is really this principle of equity. How do we make sure nobody is getting left behind? How we how do we make sure that um, you know sort of nationalism doesn't play a part in uh, in sort of hoarding the early stage vaccines? And and you know that's only going to increase inequities, but. You know, at the end of the day, we're all in this together. You can't sort of immunize everyone in the U.S. and immunize everyone in China and expect trade to still happen all over the world. So, you know, no one can really get left behind. And that's really the principle of the COVAX facility. Um, and what they're trying to solve for is really the most immediate needs, because it's quite overwhelming to think about the long-term needs, uh, at least for financial resources in order to be able to support these countries. What's different about the COVAX facility or the way it's being structured is, I think, you know, for the first time, all of these stakeholders have come together to make sure that there's, uh, they're removing obstacles or barriers in their own operating styles. So you have large organizations 
organization like Gavi, whose core mission is for you know childhood immunization. You have a large organization like CEPI, whose core mission is really pandemics and so on. Uh, but you have these organizations coming together because you know they recognize the strengths that each of them bring to the table and are able to work together. I think the second thing that's different is Gavi has historically been focused on what we call Gavi eligible countries. And this is really based on um, the GNI of countries to make sure the world's poorest countries are getting, you know, vaccine subsidy the most. And um, in order to make sure that they don't get left behind in routine immunization. I think what uh, COVID's taught us is it's not just the Gavi eligible countries, but even the uh, uh, middle income and upper middle income countries that are facing this. So in a way, um, that pool is going to be much larger than, uh, than what you would see in the Gavi eligible countries. Um, and what they're attempting to do is make sure that there is at least a certain percentage um, of vaccine that gets allocated equitably across these countries. Um, WHO, of course, will be deciding the allocation mechanism criteria based on a population threshold and first responders within that population threshold. And while WHO is going to provide guidance, it will ultimately be up to the countries um, on, 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 that, on that threshold. Um, it remains to be seen how much resources will get you know, um, raised for this effort. Those are underway. Uh, the June effort was really Gavi's uh, routine business. It was their 5.0 strategy was done. It was for the next five year period. That replenishment for Gavi's core mission was extremely successful, but we're talking about childhood immunization here. Um, by the way, I think that's gonna have to reset as well. But the COVAX facility is really steeped in the principles of equity to make sure no one gets left behind. What they're also attempting to do is give manufacturers signals with respect to demand, with respect to at-risk manufacturing. But it is going to be a challenge between balancing the risk versus the resources that are going to be available. I think the good thing is there is a, a, quite a deep sense of recognition now from people that um, that not all these vaccines are going to work. So, you know, countries are wary of putting all their eggs in one basket. And COVAX facility gives them the perfect opportunity to place their bets, as you will, against uh, a whole range of horses. I mean, I don't know how a horse racing works, but I'm still going to use that as an analogy. <laughs> that it's really that, you know, countries don't have to you know, pick one technology over the other. They have an option of the most, uh, the, the widest range of technology choices possible and the widest range of potentially price points possible as well, because, you know, all vaccines aren't created equal and I suspect they all won't, uh, you know, converge at a similar price point. So that's what the COVAX facility is, um, is attempting to do. Yeah, and it's interesting to note that we had about 78 high-income countries also come forward to participate in COVAX as of now. I think clearly shows the power of aggregation and de-risking. Yeah, and actually, you know, they view it very much like an insurance policy, in my view, because a lot of these countries that are interested in the COVAX facility already have bilateral agreements with companies that are in various stages of clinical trials. But, you know, it's a good thing that it wasn't a huge setback. But when the Oxford study was stopped, I think it gave pause to several countries to say, you know, should we be de-risking? And I think, um, I think one of the biggest advantages of the COVAX facility is, is you're not single technology dependent. You get a wide choice of products and you may not be able to cover your whole population, but for the here and now, you know, and you're also being responsible by making sure that, you know, whatever your country's um, capacity is, you're deploying for to be part of the global solution, which I think there's a moral imperative to do. And hopefully countries recognize that. Yeah, no, I think it's it's very, very uh, exciting, at least the fact that the, AM, the Gavi AMC is there to support the Gavi supported countries. Uh, there is the, the whole, whole aggregation mission. Um, anything else that Sayu couple want to add on LMIC access, equitable access, you know, 
making sure there is equitable, uh, you know, people are in disadvantage in access to a vaccine for COVID today? Yeah, thanks, Pushpa. I think, I mean, um, you know, Mahima was very eloquent in how COVAX is set up. And one of the principal reasons for COVAX is to ensure that there is access, uh, you know, throughout the world, irrespective of uh, incomes and, uh, you know, disadvantaged populations. Uh, I'm also part of the WHO Act Accelerator Group, uh, the principals group. We meet every Thursday. We're trying to answer some of those very questions albeit at a much different level. Um, having said all of that, um, I don't think anybody, any one of us or any one of our audience should have any illusions that there will not be uh, differences in access. There will be differences in access for this vaccine. Uh, I think it is very naive for us to think that uh, when, one, when a vaccine is available, it will be rolled out to all countries and all populations alike. Uh, that's not going to be the case because we just we will not have enough uh, uh, capacities and countries may not have enough financial support to procure vaccines. So there are a multitude of reasons as to why we think that the access is not going to be uniform. So some people, uh, based on countries' own risk assessments and risk perceptions, will get the vaccine ahead of time compared to others. And in some companies, it will be an economic argument. In some countries, it will be a public health argument. In some countries, it will be a national security argument. So I think it's going to be uh, really a matrix approach. And every country has to decide these issues for themselves. I don't think any uh, international agency or any outside body can convince a country of these things. I think they need to realize that if they are able to vaccinate uh, a certain percentage of their population, high-risk populations, then their country is secure or their national security is safe. Or if they are able to vaccinate 20% or 30% of their populations, then the economic recovery could be much faster. So these are realizations that countries should have. And I think their own vaccination strategies and selection criteria for who gets these vaccines will be based on that. Um, other than that, we as developers and distributors and manufacturers, I mean, we do what we do best. I mean, we can develop a vaccine, we can ensure it's safe and it's of good quality. We can make sure that we get good efficacy data. We make sure that it's WHO pre-qualified and approved by the Indian NRA and other NRAs and make it available. I think, but, but eventually as a vaccine manufacturer and a supplier, we don't know there are limits to what we can do in, you know, to ensure um, parity of who will receive these vaccines. Because once we hand over product to the government of India or UNICEF or Gavi or PAHO or the government of Turkey, for example, then it's literally in their hands as to how they want to go about this. We lose, we lose that level of um, you know, control uh, where it goes. Obviously, in the private markets, uh, we can exhibit some amount of control, but Again, majority of this product is going to go to governments and supranational organizations, and they will have to determine what is the right strategy. And that will not be a one size fits all. It will have to be designed based on each country, each region, uh, and their, their uh, economic and national security priorities. Over. Kapil, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, Mahima and uh, Sai covered most of the points. I'll just add what. Uh, so I and reiterate that, yes, as a manufacturer, I think uh, uh, we can just make a safe and an effective vaccine, but how it would be distributed would depend on how our policies and uh, regulations are rolled out. Uh, having said that, uh, so like in the COVAX facility, what I was mentioning, so 20% of the vaccine would be given to self-financing countries uh, who have a much better infrastructure to handle the vaccine. They have a much good epidemiology data to understand what is a high risk population or a high priority population. Uh, but when it comes to LMICs, the challenge comes to the epidemiological data. A uh, major challenge would be on the logistics uh, in terms of cold chain supplies. Uh, some of the vaccines which are in phase three clinical trials require minus 80 degrees Celsius storage which will become a major challenge in these countries to get it distributed in masses. So I think there would be a lot of factors on how the vaccine would be distributed uh, globally, especially in the low middle income countries. 
Uh, but again, it needs to be seen how the distribution starts once a successful vaccine is rolled out. Sure. Uh, so the COVAX is really acting at two ends here, or you know, you've all been alluding to both the push and the pull mechanisms multiple times in this conversation, and both ends of that spectrum are critical. Um, at one end, even the COVAX is really focused on aggregating demand, uh, facilitating access for countries uh, in an equitable manner. But the other end, like Gavi has, I think, done multiple times in the past, it, prevents, it, it gives manufacturers, uh, you know, a supply commitment. It's giving you visibility and some amount of de-risking uh, for that capacity creation. Uh, just wanted to see if you have know, any thoughts on what we understand there's now nine, nine, uh, nine candidates under development, nine more under evaluation. Um, do you see number of manufacturers will be supported under such programs expanding? Because I think Saeed has reminded us again that we will still not have capacity for everybody who needs it. Um, can we do more to incentivize capacity creation? Uh, and should programs like COVAX bring on board more manufacturers? Because uh, even if we do that, we still won't have enough. Any of you all want to respond? Yeah, I'll take that. Yes, no, I think, I think, see, um, I would say there is a limit and there is a, um, uh, you know, a risk perception and, uh, you know, economic risk that any of us as manufacturers can take. And, and I think beyond that, I think to the best of our, my knowledge, whether it's Indian companies or uh, companies from other parts of the developing world, US and Europe, I think they are taking a certain amount of risk and then the governments and the other agencies are burdening some part of that risk. I think that uh, partnership between agencies and companies such as ours have to increase. Without that, uh, you know, we're not, you know, we're going to take a certain amount of risk and then we're, we're gonna say that's the limit of our uh, economic ability to take risk and we're gonna stop there. But in reality, if we received some proactive funding or push funding, we could be more aggressive. But you know, we have taken a, a policy decision that you know, being a vaccine company in the developing world, uh, we're not just only for profits, although profits are important, but we also have to have a public health perspective. So based on that public health perspective, we have decided that we can take the kind of risk that we have already taken. You know, we've spent in the hundreds of crores in terms of development. Uh, we've allocated facilities for both fill finish and bioprocess. Uh, we're talking to other manufacturers in other parts of the world, and this itself is pushing us to the limits of what we can do. I mean, based on the kind of company and the size of balance sheet that we have. And beyond this, I think it's for agencies and governments and uh, entities to think through as to whether they need to accelerate this process and they need to give catalytic funding. Because, you know, the, the situation, what it is right now, it's kind of a cat on the wall situation. I think many entities are looking to see which um, entity will win, uh, which vaccine will succeed. And I personally think that's kind of the, absolutely the wrong thing to do because none of us know uh, which vaccine is going to be successful. You know, we're developing two different vaccines at various stages. We ourselves don't know today which is going to be successful and which will really make a difference in public health. Uh, so. I think it's important that, you know, whether it's a procurement agency or a country or a supranational organization or a funding agency, they need to look at these things and be more proactive and catalytic in their funding strategies. If not, uh, we are going to, there are going to be situations in COVID also that there are going to be excellent vaccine candidates, but they were not funded in the right time. Uh, either they, they will not be carried forward or they would not have invested in the scale at the right time that they should have invested in. And because of that, the vaccine availability uh, would be delayed by a year or two years. I think these are kind of the issues and problems that we know, and we have to live with this. I mean, because it's not going to be, um, uh, you know, it's not going to be a perfect situation for all products and all companies. Thank you. Top in my mind, anything to add? I couldn't agree more. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I agree with everything Sai just said. I, I think just to add another uh, perspective as well is that we really don't know enough about the epidemiology of this disease, how it's going to change or morph over time. So, you know, while there will be a demand supply gap in the interim future, because we at least see, you know, uh, countries' commitment to 
try to immunize um, uh, at least a certain percentage of their population. I mean, over time, will there be enough herd immunity where they don't perceive this to be um, a risk? Will they perceive, you know, will we bucket it in a stockpile pandemic response? Will we transition to routine immunization? And those macro level determinants will be important as we look at, you know, do we need 10 more suppliers or 20 more suppliers? There's, there's like 150 vaccine candidates. Not all of them are going to translate into a commercialized product. But, you know, how much more should we invest or should we, you know, stop? And obviously, this is true, as I said, for each company and their ability to take on risks and diversify uh, risks, even within COVID across different technology platforms. But at some point, um, the macro level factors that will influence demand, I think, will determine how much each company wants to take a risk on. So, and, and like we don't know which vaccine will work, we really don't know what this virus will transform itself into. I believe we're going to add something. Yeah, I just, uh, I think uh, what Mahima mentioned, uh, I was about to say on similar lines. As we see, uh, I think almost every day you read a new research article which is talking about a different mechanistic model on how this virus is acting. Now with the antibodies waning off very rapidly for uh, in the infected individuals and in the vaccines data which is coming out, we see that the antibodies don't last for a very long time. So how important would be a cellular immune response vis-a-vis -vis the immune response so I think as we are talking about a first wave of vaccines, uh, which would be coming in probably by the end of the year or early next year, uh, there has to be a lot of uh, push and pull mechanism of funding still to be available for late starters. Maybe there are better vaccine candidates who would come as a second generation vaccines. So that kind of a support still needs to be there. Now the pull mechanism for the initial wave of vaccine candidates needs to be built in. Uh, at Zydus, uh, being a large uh, pharma player, we started developing an independent facility for this vaccine uh, way back in February. We were very uh, committed to the candidate which we were working on, and uh, we would have a new suit available for this vaccine by first quarter of uh, 2021, uh, which would be able to provide uh, hundreds of millions of doses for the candidate. Uh, but again, there is a limit of investment. So now there has to be a commitment which needs to come in uh, for a committed number of doses. Uh, and if required, moving forward, the capacities can be further ramped up. Uh, I think these kind of uh, full mechanisms needs to be strengthened uh, as we move forward. Absolutely. No, I think it is It's very encouraging. And you know, you think of the amount of progress we have made in the last few months, you know, what normally takes 10 years, all of you all are shrinking into 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. These are unimaginable timelines. But still, when you look at the macro picture, there's still so many ifs and, you know, and you can so see that we need more catalytic support and there is so much that's possible, but it needs more fuel. Right? It needs more fuel because there's a high amount of risk of the 169 candidates. We don't know which are going to succeed. We need the vaccine produced at scale, not just developed. Uh, and having the efficacy in terms of immunity. So no, I, I think absolutely thank you. Appreciate all of that. And um, in closing, you know, any thoughts on, on, on just overall, uh, I think a reminder on core immunization not being forgotten during the times of COVID. Uh, my, my, if you want to you know, comment on that, I know we spoke about it, and I think it's very important to remind people that there is other vaccines are equally important even today, we can't forget. Yeah, I mean, there was a recent article published that in India, 30 immunizations are down by 30%. Um, and that's scary because not all states in India had very high coverage rates to begin with. So, you know, at a country level, if you're talking about a third of immunization, immunization being done by that much, it's quite scary. And the Gates Foundation put it very succinctly. They said, in 25 weeks, we've lost progress made that, that we've made for 25 years, you know? So this is a complete reset 
Um, I know that countries have postponed a lot of their measles campaigns and measles is 10 times more contagious than coronavirus and it results in fatality for huge disabilities in infants. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, this is the case, but especially in, um, in developing countries, immunization has been very community driven. So you had to, you know, you, you really deployed people like the Anganwadi workers to go into communities. Um, and there is such a scare about coronavirus and coming into contact with community workers that, you know, we, we just have to overcome this. What I see happening is, um, is all of us as manufacturers and as countries actually have to be prepared for outbreak responses. And I don't mean outbreaks related to Corona, I mean outbreaks related to polio, outbreaks related to measles. And manufacturers will have to struggle to respond because outbreak response is not business as usual. We're talking about changes in demand and having flexibility. I think that, um, as manufacturers, and we've all had these conversations amongst each other, we're trying our best to make sure that uh, routine immunization doesn't suffer at least due to lack of availability of vaccines. We don't control the last mile. We don't control country decisions if they want to stop campaigns. But the countries that at least are willing to put, you know, their, uh, you know, reinforce existing immunization, we want to make sure that we're not diverting all our resources to COVID and, you know, um, and, and letting routine immunization suffer because of, uh, of different opportunities that are in the short term. And majority of the manufacturers I speak to feel the same way as well, that you know, we have to make sure that routine immunization is supported as much as possible. But it's definitely a reset and it's not a pleasant one. Uh, we'll have to work that much harder in a much more resource constrained environment post COVID. So um, yeah, and the economic consequences are obvious, uh, but the healthcare consequences could be quite devastating. Thanks for the reminder, Mahima. Uh, On a pessimistic note, but I just think it's a reality we all have to face and uh, contribute to fixing. Yeah, no, I think it's a reminder we need, and I'm glad you bring that up, uh, that, you know, vaccines are, you know, for every other vaccine, and even the pipeline ones, for instance, I know all of you all are at it, whether it's a PCV or an HPV or Zika or others, you're not putting other programs, uh, you're prioritizing COVID, you're putting everything you can into it, we're not setting back anything else in terms of manufacturing priority, but I think as a larger community, uh, that reminder is important. Um, I couldn't thank you all more for joining us this morning. I think it's such a great reminder again of how much industry has gotten done in the short period of time. Uh, I think very, very uh, a lot of hope in terms of what you put out in the discussion uh, that by end of the year we will have uh, we will have a lot of visibility and possibly some supply, uh, but definitely a lot of visibility and understanding uh, in 2021 uh, has potential for wide-scale immunization. So I think that is um, that's encouraging. And uh, I think as a country, as a community, we're thankful for your efforts. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks so much, Pushpa. Thanks, Sai, Kapil. Thank you, Kapil. Thank you, Sai. Yeah, thanks, Pushpa. Thanks, Mahima. And thanks, Kapil. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. To sign off, there is a biomanufacturing panel, I think, after this, uh, you know, for, for the audience. Uh, enjoy that. This is, I'm glad uh, PDHD is created. I think uh, it's filled for the void in the virtual world of the kind of qualitative interactions we should be having. Uh, enjoy the other panels. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.